Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out today, and thank you to Daisy for participating in this conversation. Intense. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to begin with, to kick things off here, we are here to talk about you as a performer, but one thing I always love asking people in the film industry is, what would you be doing if you weren't in entertainment? What would you do if you weren't an actress? Um, when I, I was working uh, in a shop before I started working as an actor and my friend who's a musician was like, you shouldn't have a fallback option because then you're planning to fall back. And I was like, ooh, thoughtful. Um, so I, I weirdly was trying to think about this the other day and I can't, uh, you know, when something's your life really um, and you're like to do the thing that you love, it's so crazy to think about another world where that's not the case. Um, I do love psychology, I suppose, so that. Um, I think teachers are amazing. I don't know that I'd be a good one. Um, let's go with psychology. Yeah. Yeah. When you know, you know. Yeah. When you are looking at new projects to p potentially produce or perform in, what do they need to have for you to say yes? Um, uh... I I don't know. I think it's just like a special source of reading the thing and you either know or you don't. I uh, I had dinner with someone a few years ago who's uh, pretty high up in uh, the film situation. And he goes, the way you choose projects is so interesting. And I was like, huh, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. Um, I don't mind about size. I don't mind about there are lots of things I don't mind about. I would say the main thing is the script. And then oftentimes, if it's a director that's exciting, that is great. Uh, and then obviously, as the actors come on, hopefully the project becomes more appealing as time goes on. But first and foremost, the script. Well, d going off of that, uh, do you find yourself drawn to characters? Like, have you, uh, have you found a through line in the characters that you've played if you look back at, at your yeah. filmography? I feel in the last few years, Magpie included, um, I play women who are having a pretty hard time, um, who are often uh, slightly separate or isolated in some way. Uh, that tends to be the thing. That's not necessarily what I want to do all the time. I would love to do something with like a group that's uh, joyful too. <laughs> Um, but that tends to be the thing, battling against something, whether that's internal, external, um, uh, overcoming some mental or physical obstacle. At, w at what point in your career did you say to yourself, like, wow, I'm, I'm really doing this. Like, I am making a career out of this thing that I always knew I wanted to do. Like, you call yourself an actress when people ask, what do you do for a living? Uh, funnily enough, the night uh, we found out we got into this festival, um, I was shooting a film in England with a, a great script and a director that I love. And it was also overwhelming and my husband had just been cast in the film he just did and I was like having this overwhelming sense of gratitude and joy and wonder. And I sent my agent this hilarious voice note crying my eyes out and I was like, all I wanted to do was be a working actor and it's happening. Um, so that was like a wonderful moment. I feel like the thing is, you always feel like, is, it, uh, uh, is this gonna last? Like, is it gonna be okay? Um, so those moments of real wonder and joy and being able to just go, okay, um, I'm working and uh, yeah, that was, that was a great day. I love that it happened so recently yeah. too, yeah. Uh, after many films. <laughs> Um, I, I was reading, you know, taking a step back to the, the beginning of your career, I was reading an interview where when you were cast in Star Wars, J.J. Abrams, the, the director, said something very interesting to you, which is understand the scale. Mm -hmm. The implication there being that Ray or being in a Star Wars movie, it, you know, it, it's a different type of commitment. Mm -hmm. I am wondering, because that's a heavy thing for you were 
20 when you were cast? That's a heavy thing for a 20 year old to think about in any circumstance, let alone being on that scale and on that stage in that way. How did you weigh that when deciding ultimately to take on Ray? I mean, there was no world in which I wasn't going to. Uh, I think it's one of those things that looking back, it was a very wonderful thing for him to say. But of course, at the time I was like, yay! Um, and I, honestly, I, I didn't fully understand the scale. Um, so it was something that was, uh, it became more apparent, but until it's really here and really real, it was hard to, to understand that. Um, but the, the joy and love with which we've been embraced in this new trilogy is, um, is wonderful, but at the time, I mean, who could have known, you know? At what point did you realize it? Was it when the film was actually coming out or was it prior to that? Um, I think probably when we did the first um, sort of hello moment, which was, I'm, I'm gonna say D23, I think, or Celebration, it was, because again, I didn't even know what a convention was. Like there was so much I didn't know about. I didn't know people traveled to other countries and like talked about the films. Like there was so much to take in. Um, but I remember the first time we were out sort of together. I remember thinking, wow, this is amazing. But again, it is like, you're just a small part of it. And of course, um, I, it's wonderful how Ray is received, but the films are the films. So to be part of something and to be part of a team of people, you never feel alone, like you're shouldering something. You feel like you're part of a team of people who are hopefully bringing joy to people. Well, well going off of that, I am wondering, because every you know, couple of years it happens when a, a newcomer performer gets thrust into this position of playing an outsized role. You know, we see that with franchise filmmaking and superhero filmmaking. I'm wondering then, what advice would you give to someone entering a position similar to the one that you were entering into at the beginning of Star Wars? What advice would you offer? Um, try and enjoy it. Uh, it's so individual, really. Um, but try and enjoy it. I think a lot of people were like, your life is going to change. And so in the lead up to the film coming out, I was so scared when actually, um, of course things changed in a great way, but I was so caught up with worrying about what other people were telling me was going to happen that it took honestly to making the third film till I felt like, okay, like I'm good. Like I deserve to be here and as much as I work hard and like I'm, you know, um, so try and enjoy it and embrace it because also life goes quick as we all know like it just goes by in a flash um, so probably just breathe and and enjoy the ride when you were coming out of that last Star Wars movie you had spent a lot of years on those films and you had done several films in between as well but those, those films were time consuming I might imagine uh, how did you go about looking to navigate your career in terms of, you know, post Star Wars? I'm sure you had a lot of offers coming in. How did you figure out where you wanted to go next after such a heightened time? There weren't that many offers coming in. It's not that there weren't like any, but I remember finishing and thinking, oh my God, and it felt so quiet and strange. And then we went into lockdown. So it was like a very strange time to like sit with the choir and honestly like grieving a time of my life. It had been eight years by that point of being with people, working with people and then, and suddenly it was done. It was so strange. So it was, uh, sitting with that was odd. And then honestly I felt not like I was beginning again, but I was, it took a few months for me to start reading stuff that was, felt real at least that it was actually gonna go. Um, yeah, I don't know that I felt like I was re-searching, re but there was more time suddenly, but there was also so much time because of lockdown. Um, that's a terrible answer, but basically I don't, uh, I sat with everything for a little while and, um, and the first thing I did was The Marsh King's Daughter. 
Um, so it was also strange to be back on a set because I hadn't been on a set for a while by the time I was back there. Um, and then the last few years has been really busy and amazing and I've got to do so many different things with so many different people. So it has been a different exploration of myself and my career. When you were coming back to set for the first time on The Marsh King's Daughter, it sounds uh, like such an interesting transitional period because not only are you coming out from that, from Star Wars, you're coming out of COVID, but that transition from you know massive uh, tentpole filmmaking to Marsh King's Daughter, which was smaller, and you had done smaller films like Ophelia in the middle there, but what was that experience like having had that time during COVID and then coming back to a set that is very different from the previous set that you had been on, you know, years prior? Mm. Um, again, I don't know that I felt so differently the scale of it. At that time, I was so happy to be at work. It was really nice to be like, ooh, I'm doing something new. And then I followed a few weeks after wrapping that with Sometimes I Think About Dying, which was in budget and scale and everything. So in that time, that was interesting, but I didn't feel, coming into The Marsh King's Daughter, I didn't feel like it was so different because also it was quite, uh, it was like big scale in terms of the landscape and the story and, um, but really I was like, yay! Because honestly, I just love acting. I was like so happy to be acting. And strangely enough, the little girl who was cast in that, who inspired Magpie, well, inspired the seed of magpie. Um, that was so wonderful to be with um, a child. And we had been, obviously, everyone was having an awful, difficult time prior to that. And um, she was this, like, bright spark of joy. And we played together for two months and had this relationship on and off screen. Um, we were like little buds. Uh, so she was a real joyful way back into everything. Well, that's, uh, that's a great transition into Magpie, which is the film that you are here with. For the people who haven't you know, been able to see it uh, from the premiere yesterday, can you kind of explain just a synopsis of the film? Um, I play a character called Annette in Magpie. Um, I have a husband played by Shazad Latif called Ben in the film, and we have two kids in the film. Um, and our little girl is cast in a film playing the stepdaughter of a very famous actress called Alicia. And um, my husband chaperones her to work and falls intensely and quickly in longing for the actress who is playing the motherly role to my child. And Annette is left at home with the baby, um, struggling under the weight of a lot of difficulties within the marriage and at breaking point, and the pressure is applied heavily, and uh, the film follows where that pressure goes. Yeah. And I, no, it's really great, guys. Uh, I heard like a collective sigh <laughs> after that synopsis. Um, uh, I know you mentioned that the Marsh, your experience on The Marsh King's Daughter was the inspiration for the story, which you came up with. Uh, can you take us through that inspiration and how you get from there to that synopsis? It was really that me and Joey, who was playing my daughter, I just thought, how is this... It's so strange. You're on these sets, everything's super intense. Everything's like ramped up to 100. You're working together for 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, oftentimes very intimate, emotional scenes between people. And she knew, obviously, that I was not her parent, but she was calling me mummy at work. And I was like, this is so crazy. And her dad was chaperoning her, and her mum was at home with a baby and another child. <laughs> so at the end of the, the job, when I had this idea, I was like, this isn't really about us. It was just, yeah. you know, that dynamic was interesting. But I got home, and my husband, uh, who's here somewhere, uh, picked me up, and I told him the initial thing, and he really sculpted it into where it went, because initially the idea was an actress infiltrating a family, and what that would do. Um, and then Tom's feeling was that it was interesting to follow the wife who's left at home, who is um, not having fun and not in the romance of a film set. And she's looking after a small baby and struggling, really, with all of the weight of that. 
What did development look like on this movie? You all had the idea for it in what year, and, and then at what point did you bring partners on to bring it to fruition? Um, it was fairly, it's all happened fairly quickly. Uh, probably in the last two and a half years, I'm gonna say. Um, I'm called The Rocket. I like to get shit done. <laughs> um, I had the idea, Tom started writing. He's an amazingly fast writer and also is, um, I mean, the tension and everything that is created in this story is unbelievable. Um, and then we pitched to Kate Solomon, who came on, and she helped us craft the thing of what we know, what, what the audience knows, what the audience doesn't know, what we're seeing, is there anything we're not seeing, and weaving all that into um, the story. And then we brought on Sam, who pitched to us and was unbelievable, uh, our director. And together it was really just a wonderful combination of energy and um, similar tastes, really. And the story that we wanted to make is the story that we've made, which is so wonderful. I was honestly so overwhelmed last night. I had a little cry when the credits ran because it's... It's a feat to make something, anything. And to do it with a group of people you really respect and admire. And to really be joyful in presenting something um, and standing solid with what you've presented is not always the case. And it's, uh, yeah, I feel really genuinely so thrilled by the team that we had. This is the second feature that you've starred in and, and produced. P performers talk about having more creative control when they also act as producers, but what does that look like practically? You know, what conversations and insights have you found helpful in your career as a producer that you weren't getting prior to that? I have to say, um, uh, the first set I was on playing a, a character for longer than a week, which was Star Wars, was a director who was so collaborative, so wonderful, made me feel heard, made me feel I had a voice. So I have actually always felt very included creatively, which is wonderful. Um, I was credited as a producer on Sometimes I Think About Dying. <laughs> I don't know that I deserved it. <laughs> um, I was on and I helped secure financing and I was asked about creative choices, which was wonderful. But um, lots of other people did so much work that I was not involved with. Um, so this was really the first film where I was there from the ground up um, on conversations about money and pre-sales and... Um, and actually being in the Zoom room, because I was filming elsewhere, for casting and uh, getting in heads of department. So in, this res on, in that respect, I, this was the first time that I was really part of all that. But it's funny, I'm literally mid-shooting a film now in Western Australia. It took me so long to get here. <laughs> and, um, th and the producer knows the producer of Young Woman and the Sea, and he was like, you know, apparently you're such a great creative collaborator. And I was like, look, on this film, I'm good, like I'm good as an actress. And then lo and behold, I'm like having conversations about all sorts of things that I didn't really expect. So basically I think I can't resist now getting involved. Um, but it's wonderful. I'm not a writer, but I think I have good ideas. Um, and as performers, I think you know when things work and when they don't. So feeling like you have a voice in any regard, whether you're credited or not really, and people taking you seriously is quite amazing. Um, but in terms of Magpie, I really have been there. I mean, Kate has done obviously much of the work, but also being in a position to employ people who are much more um, experienced than you are and know what they're doing. And then you're like, great, great. I can like sit and watch you make these amazing decisions. Um, so that's great. And what I really honestly wanted to do on Magpie was facilitate a great working environment. Like I wanted people to feel safe. I wanted f people to feel creative and respected and communicated to. And it's, it sounds so silly, but food on film sets can be not very good. And we were like, the food has to be good and there has to be coffee. People are working really hard. We want people to have a good time. 
Um, and the hair up and makeup designer on Magpie, Tamsin, came on to the last film I did in the UK. And she was like, God, the food was good on that job. And what I thought, was the food? I gotta know. We just had great caterers and people were like, looked forward to their meals. And it's, you know, when people are working these intense hours and like we were, it was a contained thing and we were getting lots done. Um, just that moment to actually enjoy that your rest time and also sit around with people that you like. And um, so fostering a good work environment is something that I was really proud of at the end of the job with a group of people who were really happy to be part of that experience. Other than food, very important. Uh, how do you foster that good work environment? I know you've talked about collaboration, mm. but what does that look like on set when you're there on the ground physically? Um, communication, uh, letting people know what you're doing. Um, I've been on jobs where people are like, wait, what? Uh, what was that? Like, what are the setups? What's going on? And it's not like everyone has to know everything, but it's good for people to be over all of that. Um, what else? Wait, I just had a thought, but I'm jet lagged, so it's gone. Um, communication. It'll come to me. There's something else. <laughs> Bring it back whenever, whenever you remember it. Um, going off of what you said, how, how have you or how do you plan on deciding when you will just be a performer on a project versus a producer and a performer? Or just a producer, if that's in your future. Um... I think the, the job I'm currently on, I'm just a performer, wink, um, because it's become more than that. But technically, I'm just a performer. Um, I mean, I love Tom's writing, so that's something that's very exciting going forward and how, what the next thing will be, which we might be working on. Um, and then there are also other people I'd like to work with. And it's interesting, like I read an amazing pilot a couple of weeks ago, which I signed on to, and they were like, you're welcome to come on board if you like it. And because it's such early days, that will probably be a thing of me being part of it. Um, because that's such a thrill to do something from the beginning. Um, but again, I don't know that I am like, it's either, it, it just is the right time, I guess. Like if something comes along that's fantastic and it's just performing, great. And if it's producing as well, great. Going back to Magpie, how long did you all have to shoot this? Because I understand that it's contained, but mm. it's pretty expansive in terms of set pieces mm. and sequences. We were trying to figure it out. We think it's 23 days. Yeah. I actually thought of another thing, fostering a good work yeah. environment, <laughs> is thanking people and validating people. Um, so simple, but great. And I think that can, again, in very intense ways, can slightly get lost sometimes but making people feel appreciated is, as we all should feel appreciated in our workplaces. Um, but Magpie, yes, we shot it in 23 days. And I had shot, sometimes I think about dying, I think in 23, so I knew it could be done. Um, and it really was amazing because it focused everyone so much and it was an intense working environment and the film's intense. So I think it felt, I think it was helpful actually in that way. But also we were never rushed. We always had time to go again. We had time to play. All the actors felt like they had time to explore stuff. So it was, uh, uh, it, it felt like the right time, the right amount of time. Yeah. Why do you feel that you were never rushed? Because I, I have a lot of conversations with filmmakers who are talking about similar production timelines and, and we're like, oh, there was n never enough time. Is that because of pre-planning? How do you, yeah. as filmmakers, make sure that you get there with the right amount of time? Um, Sam, our director, and Laura, our DP, were just an amazing team. So we, well, they had shot listed the whole film before we started filming. We went through all the shots, uh, were realistic about what we could do and what we couldn't. And then every morning we gathered together a group of us and talked through the day and figured out what we could get in the time. And if time allowed, extras if they were needed. Um, so it, it was just focused, like hyper-focused from everyone. Um, and also me getting changed in a toilet upstairs while they were, you know, getting ready for the next thing. Um, but yes, intense focus is what I would say. But also, I suppose some productions, it, it must be more difficult. It just so happened that this, it worked for us. My favorite question to ask independent filmmakers is, you know, what is the one 
set piece, sequence, shot, casting that when you were heading into production, you thought, not sure how we're going to pull this one off. And then ultimately you do, because that's how f films get made. You know, what was that? And then how did you and your team ultimately push through to get it done? Uh, for Magpie, I would say the film within the film, uh, which if you've not seen the film that they're making, you actually see it play out and then you see it, you sort of see it, how, how do you describe it? You see it as though it's the film and then you see the film within the film. You see the film world. Um, that was uh, more of a challenge. We had spent two weeks in the house, uh, which was basically me, Shaz, uh, and the kids. So it was more contained in a cast way. And then the film within the film was um, a lot of people and supporting artists and big scope in terms of getting this beautiful location that we had. Um, and that was, I'd say, more of a scramble to get. Uh, but again, I think planet, also costumes and hair and makeup, it was all slightly more um, ornate. Um, uh, intense planning and also using our wonderful crew in the film. Oftentimes crew do not want to be in films, but our, some of our crew also were Also your film. crew was the crew not all in of the them, making of the but movie. there are a few. There are some? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun. So that was great and we used our trailers in the, again, we had so many amazing resources. I, the hair designer on The Force Awakens is married to a guy that like runs uh, facilities company called Translux and I called him and was like hey please can we use some trailers so we had like so many amazing resources that were offered to us um, so we also thank all of them uh, you have such a great on-screen relationship with the little girl in this movie and you know you've you sounds like you built that on Marsh King's Daughter and in a meta way you built it again on this one. How do you do that? Because there's the old adage of, you know, never work with kids and, and animals. You know, how do you, how do you get a performance out of a young performer as a scene partner? Uh, I think I've been so lucky. Um, when we, Hiba, who plays my daughter in the film, she was in the first round of tapes and I was like obsessed immediately. And we saw other kids who were amazing, but she had, I don't know, she just had something so compelling about her. And she is super smart, like super, super smart, to the point that she had not, she does not know the story. And uh, through filming went to me, Ben is not the hero of this film. And I was like, what, how do you know that? And she goes, I just know. Ben is not the hero. She had like figured all this stuff out and honestly people were not telling her stuff. But she's just, she's like a little sponge. She's so, watches and takes things in and and honestly, even if she was super giggly, she would, they'd call action and out this little amazing prodigy performance would come. So it really was not difficult building a relationship with her. She's the most wonderful, wonderful little girl. That's incredible. And you, you all intentionally didn't tell her what was happening in the story? No. Oh, yeah. She doesn't need to know. I mean, she's involved in enough of the scenes that it's, uh, you know, it's uncomfortable watching her be uncomfortable. She's, her little viewpoint is so important because she's this innocent little thing between these two people that are having a very difficult time and not being very nice to each other. Um, so we kept... Yeah, I don't know that we really told her anything. I guess uh, looking back on it, it's like, how, how do you explain yeah. marital turmoil to a yeah. child? Don't do that to them. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, she just is smart and took in what was going on and was very, I think even, and I'm probably going to bastardize this, so sorry, Sam. But when we were doing the car scenes, she was like, okay, so I look to you, and then I look to you, and then I'm like, and like she's working it all out. It was just honestly unbelievable to watch her. And it does keep you very present with another little person who you're trying to keep present. Uh, and also she had not uh, been on a set before. She'd done a couple adverts, but hadn't done uh, anything like this. So I also wanted to make sure she felt very good. And she had an amazing person with her who was helping out and keeping her 
diverted because they are long days. So there was a real team effort to keep her comfortable. That's amazing. Um, having, having produced now and obviously performed, are there any other jobs on set that you would want to tackle? You seem very adept at craft services, I will say that. Um, but you know, writing, directing, any other part of filmmaking? I just don't think I'm a writer. Uh, a little while ago, I had an idea. And I thought, I'm going to write this one. And I wrote seven pages and I said, this is the best script that's ever been written. <laughs> and honestly, I've never looked back. It's saved on my desktop. I still think it might be the best script ever written. It is not written yet. Uh, the idea was good. I just don't know that I'm the one to take it to the page. So I feel like in the ideas world, I'm good. Maybe not the writing. In terms of directing, I feel like... Um, I could, I could facilitate good, good performances from people. And strangely enough, the guy I'm working with now, he was like, he's Australian, excuse me while I do this, but he goes, Daz, you should direct. And I was like, ooh. Um, but I don't, I, I, I can't, if it were ever to happen, it would be a long way off. But like I've tried things, I've tried being a dolly grip so hard. I've tried being a camera operator so hard. I've held a boom. The, on The Force Awakens, I basically wanted to have done something from every uh, crew member. So I've done special effects. Uh, what else have I done? I mean, not really, but uh, I've tried it all and it's so difficult. And crew members are unbelievable. Yeah. The upper body strength of boom operators. I'm just like, what is your weight regimen? <laughs> Uh, you know, a lot of ink has been spilt across industries, across all jobs, about work-life balance and burnout, especially in the post-COVID years. I'm, I'm wondering, what do you do to decompress, whether it's on set or in between projects? Um, the, probably the shortest amount of time I've had between projects is between The Marsh King's Daughter and Sometimes I Think About Dying. And then the job I finished in December and then starting in February, and I was like, that's quick. Um, and it had to be, because it was facilitating something else, then of course fell away. Um, and in that time I had other bits and bobs going on, so it's actually been quite a busy time. So to decompress, <laughs> I sometimes sit on the sofa crying. Um, <laughs> a great pastime, yeah, if there yeah, ever was one. <laughs> yeah. Um, there had been like a family thing and I was in France and it was also stressful. So I basically put on the saddest film I could find, which was Dan Levy's film, Good, Good Grief. Yeah. And literally cried so much, felt much better afterwards. Uh, I read, like to go to the cinema, eat good food, work out, all the usuals basically, and see my family a lot. Uh, spend time with my husband as much as is humanly possible. Um, and see my parents, uh, yep. In terms of uh, upcoming projects, you have The Young Woman in the Sea, and, which is about the first woman ever to swim the English Channel, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that sounds hard. What does the physical preparation look like for something like that? Um, it's funny, I thought that was the toughest thing on my body I had done, and then I did an action movie with the amazing Martin Campbell, which is the movie I did before Christmas, and was like, ow, <laughs> everything hurts. Uh, Young Woman in the Sea, I trained with an Olympian, which I introduce her, because now we're friends, I introduce her as an Olympian to everyone, and she's like, please, can you not do that? Uh, we trained for three months, and honestly, the first time I tried to do length, I stopped halfway. I couldn't do it. I could not complete a length because I had never properly swum before. I'd like float about in some water, but I'd never done the front crawl properly. Um, so that was, that was uh, tough. And then we carried on training throughout filming. Um, and then we had one pickup day a few months later. So I trained again. And then we did a, I did a day of swimming that felt like the most swimming a person has ever done in their lives. <laughs> And then I've never swam again. You're like, I've I done, was, I've yeah. done it. I've done and a you know, whole some, lifetime. Some people go and do like a, a sports movie and they go, it really got me into such and such. I said, well done, all you swimmers. Uh, that's not for me. It was great to be able to do it. And then I, 
if I could just float and never actually move my arms in the water again, I'd be good. <laughs> How does having that intense physical preparation affect performance? Does it help build character? I would say, uh, because to do something that is physically oftentimes unbelievable to other people requires such dedication and such determination um, that to be constantly in that mindset, you're like, no wonder people do these unbelievable feats of endurance. So in terms of that, I would say, yes, it was very, very helpful because I knew what it, well, somewhat pretended to know what it required for Trudy to do the swim across the channel. Um, and because obviously it changes your body like traps and everything swimming. So you hold yourself in a different way, all of those things that you don't uh, necessarily think about and then end up facilitating character. Uh, and I, I know you mentioned this, but uh, your upcoming projects include a Martin Campbell movie as well as a survival thriller, We Bury the Dead. Yes, which is what I'm currently shooting. Yeah, I, I am, and both sound very intense. The Martin Campbell movie, I believe an army veteran turned window cleaner and it yeah. may be on the side of the shard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we called it dry shard. Um, it's very, uh, it's fun. It's fun in a Martin Campbell way. Um, I play a window cleaner who is ex-army, knows how to use a gun, all the useful things in an action film. Um, and I'm outside the building when a team of uh, eco-activists storm the building and I have to fight my way in, in tandem with the police outside and try and find my brother and save all the people who have been taken hostage. It's very uh, exciting. The action is brutal and amazing. Uh, and also in... I was re-watching all of Martin's films as we went. What a filmmaker. Like, amazing performances, always a lot of humor, and amazing action set pieces. Um, so I felt like all of the action is what I think people think of with Martin oftentimes. But also emotionally, it was wonderful working with him. Like, such a taskmaster. Many, many, many takes. One of his notes was, didn't feel at that time, try again. One of the things he said to an actor is, fake, <laughs> literally. Um, so it was like, you were like, humble. Uh, but it was an amazing experience to work with someone who's so laser focused on connection and togetherness in amongst all of this fun action, wonderful. Um, and yes, I'm currently mid shooting We Bury the Dead. Uh, which is sort of a survival thriller about a woman trying to get to her husband who, has, who was on an island that has accidentally been nuked by the US. Yep. <laughs> yep, soz. I, I, those three projects, though, you know, The Young Woman in the Sea, uh, We Bury the Dead, and The, the Cleaner, I, they sound very high-octane in their own ways and very physical in their own ways. Do you find yourself being attracted to certain types of projects at the same time. Like you're attracted to a lot of very physical performances and you'll do a run of those and a lot of quiet performances and you'll do a run of those. Is that something you've noticed in your career? Funnily enough, the one I'm doing now is not, uh, not that physical. Um, strangely enough for me. Um, as in it sounds, there's a lot of physical things happening but not for my character. Um, no, I think that's just a funny timing thing. Um, Cleaner, I read last May, and we were supposed to go June, we were supposed to go July, we were supposed to go August. So it's one of those things that kept getting pushed, and then We Buried the Dead amazingly fell in that time. And again, Young Woman in the Sea, the filmmakers have been trying to make for eight years, with various iterations of actor as Trudy, um, so that was an amazing thing that finally came together in the most joyful way. But often, you just don't know what's gonna happen at what time you sign on to uh, things not knowing when they'll actually become real. 
I, I wanted to talk about that because I think it's something that isn't talked about, especially in press, because so often performers are doing press after the movie's done and it comes out, but you know, as a reporter at a trade, we know how many projects get put into development mm. and how many fall by the wayside for various reasons. When you really fall in love with a project and for whatever reason it doesn't happen, how do you come to terms with that? It's really hard. It's, um, I think I've got better at it, but it does happen all the time. I, a few years ago, I took it, I suppose, a lot more personally and felt like it was my fault it didn't happen. Um, uh, it's still sad, um, but also I've been the recipient of things that fell apart with other people, and I'm like, thank you. Uh, it's amazing to be involved in something, even if you weren't the first person, um, to, ha to be part of something then in the form that it ends up being. Uh, but it is always hard because you love things and love directors and love writers and uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's difficult. One thing that you're gonna revisit coming up in the future is your character, Ray. Uh, that project's been announced. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what does it mean to revisit a character after having a break from them? I know you haven't done the movie yet, but what are you looking forward to in terms of performance? You know, so much has happened in your career, in your life, in between the last time you played Ray and then when you will be shooting this. What are you looking forward to in that process? It feels so strange. I think the reality of it is I just don't know how it'll be till I'm there. And also I was like so excited to be part of it. And then I thought, what if I can't remember how to play her? It's such an odd thing to, because also it was a surprise. It was only last year and I had a breakfast that I thought was something else and it wasn't. And so it is exciting, but it's so, I think I'll be maybe not as terrified on the first day, but there is a certain amount of what, what if I don't know? What if I can't do it? Or what if the chain, you know? Like all of the what ifs are very strange. Um, but I'm excited about the story. And as you say, a lot has happened in my life, in my career. So I feel like a different performer. I feel like a different person as we all do after a certain amount of years. Um, so I'm curious, and also working with a new director is very exciting, but also it's like what discoveries will be made there. It's all at this time to be discovered, and I'm excited but nervous, really, to see how it goes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I do have one final question before we get into some of the questions from the audience, which is when I was preparing for this conversation, I had read about your day job prior to becoming, uh, or while you were looking to become a performer, which is you worked in pubs and bars. I am, as a person who's worked in hospitality and food service, I'm wondering how, if in any way, did that experience prepare you for a career in entertainment? It's a lot of juggling, I gotta say that. It's quite funny, my husband's like, what haven't I done as a job? I've literally been a receptionist at a doctor's. I've, I worked as, um, strangely enough, when we were filming Cleaner, we were in um, Canada Water, which is a part of London, and there's a mall next door. I had worked in the mall as an elf, and then I got promoted to being a princess. Yeah, so there were the princesses and then there were the elves. I honestly don't know who paid for this. It was through an events company. But like kids would come and you take your, your picture with the kids. Was it all at Christmas time or was this just an elf? Yeah, no, it was all uh, at Christmas. Non-Christmas Imagine elf. it was all, yeah. Okay. No, it was <laughs> at Christmas. And there were like houses around the mall and people would come. Like I have this vivid memory of sat in this princess costume eating my tuna pasta because I wasn't vegan then. And like a knock at the window and this kid was there and I was like, I'm having lunch, please. Uh, it was, I, yeah, so I've done that. I've worked in shops, I've worked in all the stuff. And another strange thing is that when I was just in Paris doing press for Sometimes I Think About Dying, a guy, I was in breakfast and I looked at this guy, I was like, God, this guy is so familiar. And he comes over and he goes, you're Daisy. I was like, yeah, why do, do I know you? And he goes, you used to serve me in the pub. And of all of the hotels, in all of Paris, 
This guy was there with his wife, and he also did a photo book about David Bowie, which is like so cool, and was there honoring David Bowie. But I was like, this is the strangest thing. Um, all that unnecessary <laughs> diversion is to Incredible. say, I don't know. I mean, you're, you, you talk to different people all the time, which I suppose is good on a set because you talk to people all the time. Um, otherwise, life and entertainment. I don't know, maybe that, maybe talking to different people and encountering different people from all walks of life in like an evening, um, working at a pub, maybe that. And you are so ready to play an elf now. You are prepared. You've done the research. I would love to do a Christmas movie. I love Christmas movies. I would, I would love, I genuinely love to play an elf. Amazing. Well, I'm going to open it up to some of the questions that people have submitted. Um, off the top, we talked about this, but I think it's very important uh, to discuss with performers uh, this question from Zoe is, as an actress, what qualities do you look for in directors that help elevate your performance and bring the best out of you on set? That is a good question. I think it can be a case of different strokes for different folks. Um, sometimes it's in the work they've already done. Um, in terms of Sam, who directed Magpie, this was his uh, feature debut. Um, so it was his sensibility as a person and how he felt about the story and how he felt about the characters and sort of getting to know him. I had an understanding of what he would bring to set. Um, but it might be work that you admire. God, I don't know. And I think it's quite individual. Um, oh my God, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I suppose being a fan of theirs. And really, again, you don't know, ultimately, until you're on set working with the person. And often, if you get on, that helps, because you're building a relationship as, the, as time goes on. So you're getting to know each other, and your director is getting to know your capabilities, and uh, maybe how you'd like to be pushed, or uh, what it is that brings out the best in you. So I think it's like a case-by-case case thing, probably. But often, I would say I veer towards who they are and whether you feel like you have a connection with them as a person. Uh, if you're willing to say, what are some filmmakers that you haven't worked with yet that you would really love to? I mean, so obvious, but Greta Gerwig. Yeah. <laughs> Denis Villeneuve. Wes Anderson. Um, yeah, there's lots. I was meant to do a film. One of the things that I thought was going to happen and ended up not happening with Matthew Kasovitz, which I was very excited for, and hopefully that will come back in some way. Um, oh, yeah, that's good. Let's, let's say those for now. Yeah. Uh, another question from Emily. What is the most unexpected difference between the onset culture of working on a blockbuster versus working on smaller indie films? Um... Uh, I, I really don't feel personally there's such a big... I mean, there's the thing of, like, bigger films, you get a trailer. But, like, I love to be on set, so I'm not really in my trailer. I think whether you're making a film that costs, I don't know, 20 million, a million, 20 million, 200 million, which I've strangely done them all... Um, you're working on something where the project is the thing and you're all trying to elevate your own work to make the project the most elevated it could be. So I feel like I approach things in the same way, really. And I felt that crew and cast around me do the same thing. And I think maybe also I thought there would be a bigger difference between the two, but I don't know in terms of like the feel of setness, but you are forever trying to do your best work. And I think that's the case for whatever budget or whatever scale the film is. Um, Kaylee is asking, what is your process for getting into character for different roles? Does it change role to role? Um, it's been interesting over the last few years because um, doing an American accent, I have more of a process, I suppose. I work with 
an amazing accent coach called Rick Lipton. Um, and because of the nature of having to prepare for a week of dialogue in an accent that isn't yours, we go through scenes in a way that I wouldn't... It's not that I wouldn't do it for the week ahead in an English accent, but you're doing it out loud with someone else, which is interesting and brings up interesting ideas. When we were preparing for Young Woman in the Sea before we'd got into rehearsal, me and Rick went through the whole script, and it gave me a lot of ideas of script ideas, which was fantastic. And then it was strange because before Magpie, I had done three American films. Marsh King's Daughter, Sometimes Think About Dying, and Young Woman in the Sea, and I thought, how am I meant to do this in an English accent? I can't remember how to do this. Um, so it felt different, but I suppose it's... Uh, you're not preparing a, an accent, but you're preparing it in as much as you're getting everything ready for the day, and then you're trying to be available and present, and all of the work that you've done before you get to set is to help you feel available on the day. And then getting back into an American for this one, I was like, how do I do this? I can't remember how to do this. So each time it's that so lots of reading and thinking and getting the scenes ready and then trying to be open to whatever it is that's happening between you and your scene partner what is the most difficult accent that you've had to do what was the hardest one to kind of nail down for you um I'm, fi I'm finding doing my general American for this one really hard I feel like having done the two English things I'm like is it how is this and the other American accent films I've done, I've been surrounded by people either doing an American accent or they are American. I am basically the only American in this one and everyone else is Australian. And I mean, I do mess around a lot on set. So the other day, me and Brenton, who I'm working with, the wonderful Brenton Thwaites, we were plotting through a scene and I was like, why don't I do an Australian accent in this scene and you do an American? Because... I love to waste time like that on set. <laughs> and that was actually very hard. And I thought, okay, so the American is there. Um, but it's, it is difficult keeping it uh, surrounded by Australians. Uh, a great question from Dylan, which is, uh, what are some neo-noir stories that have had an influence on you? Which, I don't know if we said this, but Magpie is uh, noir. Yes. Um, that... Uh, is neo noir? It's a it's a it's a great question. One that I am struggling to think of an answer on. Were you all looking at films? Yeah, for inspiration. We had, um, the films that Tom and I referenced when we first took the project to Kate were Homecoming, the TV show with Julia Roberts, with those amazing zooms and very intense feeling. Gone Girl. Um, God, what else? Oh, Tully. Uh, was one with a woman really struggling in a in a family situation, and then Sam's references um, were demi films, and uh, as in we were all discussing them, but particularly uh, for him and Laura in terms of capturing the imagery, um, demi and Hitchcock, uh, The Shining, and um, but sort of a big scope. Because also the film's interesting, it starts sort of as a relationship drama and then takes a bit of a genre twist. Um, so there were, yeah, from different genres, but lots of amazing inspirations. How did the, uh, playing in that genre affect performance? Because noir performances for female performers specifically are, have been so lauded throughout film, did you find yourself changing performance because you knew the genre was noir? Strangely enough, no. I think the way Tom wrote her was someone who is uh, under an intense amount of pressure, which is the one of the archetypal things. Um, so I think the writing facilitated that. And strangely enough, I wasn't... Again, when you're surrounded by amazing people who know that they're doing and setting an amazing tone and scene and you're in this beautiful place with this gorgeous lighting and all this mood. Um, uh, I wasn't thinking so much about that, uh, strangely enough. Yeah. Uh, a question from Ashley. You spoke to Project Scale. Do you still entertain the idea of smaller independent projects if the script is fantastic, but with lesser known directors and producers? Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, simple answer is yeah. 
I, um, as I said, Sam was a, this is his feature debut. Um, Rachel Lambert, who I worked with on Sometimes I Think About Dying, had made a few gorgeous films. Um, uh, but then obviously compared to Martin Campbell, who's made 40 films, it's less than in terms of how many uh, there have been output-wise. Um, so yeah, that is not necessarily a, um, a worry for me. I'm still thinking about Martin Campbell just yelling fake <laughs> after takes. It's what a what a move. Uh, really incredible stuff. Um, can you comment on the importance of female characters playing strong female characters in films? You have did that incredibly with Ray. Uh, I, it was an audience question that had come up, and I think it's an uh, an important one to talk about. It just feels like well, yeah. I mean, we're half the world. Like, yeah. Um, obviously, I don't know if everyone's seen the statistics over the past few years of like representation in the past year, and actually, that some ways it's dipped. Yeah, it's actually the the annual reports came yeah. out uh, last year, and female representation both uh, below the line. Yep and on screen and behind screen have, have dipped yep. uh, in comparison to years past. Yep. We're trending downward overall. Yep. Not great. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, hello, women. We're, yeah, as I said, we're half of us in, in this joint. Um, <laughs> yes, I feel, and honestly, I feel lucky every time I get to be on set and play these amazing things that are created. Um, and it was depressing to read those statistics. And also strange, because I also love watching women on screen. And I think a lot of people love watching women on screen, so it's strange that it's a downward thing. Uh, particularly when Barbie was literally one of the most watched things in the world. Um, so hopefully that's a temporary blip, and then we're back on the way up. Yeah. Well, with Magpie, you are bringing a very strong, interesting, kind of scary uh, character to the screen. So to close things out here, I'm wondering what do you hope audiences see in the film uh, when, it, when it does come out? I mean, the character I play is not totally good. She is complicated, as we all are. Um, and we would hope that people's, as the film, uh, the film changes tack a little way in, in terms of perspective, and you're suddenly like, wait, I think I made a few assumptions. So I would hope that everyone buckles in for a wild ride and honestly enjoys it. We made it to be entertaining, and we wanted a character piece, but we also wanted an entertaining piece of cinema. Um, and I hope people have thoughts about it. We had, the first screening we did, like a feedback thing, it was, amazing to hear the different responses from people so different my agent came last night and she saw it last year before it was finished when she didn't have a baby and then she saw it last night now she does have a baby different perspective um so i would hope that it sparks a conversation um but mainly i hope people enjoy the ride well, thank you so much for the film and also for this conversation. And thank you, all of you, for joining us. Thank you all so much for being here.